Okay, so I think we'll make a start. Um, so this tutorial, uh, so this is going to be in two parts, so I'll do, this, do the second part at the same time next week. But what I hope to do is give you uh, an introduction to computer architecture. And this is, this is really intended for people who are uh, doing or thinking about doing optimization work on, on codes. Uh, and hopefully what I'm trying to do here is give you an understanding of the, the underlying architecture of machines that you're likely to be working on um, so that some of the optimizer, hopefully some of the optimization techniques will, will make more sense and uh, you'll understand what's going on in, in, in the hardware. Okay, so So actually, if we think about HPC systems, then there are, there are really sort of four main principal technologies which go in into, into building an HPC system. And we've got uh, processors to do the calculation. We've got memory for temporary storage of data. We've got the interconnect so that processors can talk to each other uh, and also to the outside world. And then we have some, some secondary storage, so disks for storing input and output data, uh, and maybe tapes for long-term archiving of data. But these talks are really going to focus on the first two of these, and really thinking about what's inside a single node, which is processors and memory. So I should just say, uh, please feel free to type questions into the chat box as we go along. But I'll also give a, uh, we'll also have a, a question and answer session at, at the end of the uh, end of the talk. So let's start off by looking at processors. So the basic functionality, of course, is to execute instructions to perform arithmetic operations, so both integer and, and floating point and to load data from memory and store data back to memory, and also to decide which instructions to execute next, so follow the flow of control through the program. So in almost all modern processes, arithmetic is performed on values which are stored in registers. So the registers form local storage in the processor, and moving data between memory and registers has to be done explicitly by the processor issuing load and store instructions. Typically, we'll have separate registers to hold integer and floating point values. And the typical size is order of 100 values. So usually comes in powers of 2, so 64, 128. That kind of thing would be absolutely typical. Basic characteristics of processors which uh, determine their performance are the clock speed and very closely related to that, the peak floating point capability. So the clock speed determines the rate at which instructions are executed in the processor. So modern chips are around about the 2 to 3 gigahertz uh, mark in terms, of, in terms of clock rate. But there's also, as we'll talk more in detail as we go along, uh, there is, there's also a lot of parallelism going along here. So for example, integer and floating point calculations can typically be done in parallel. And we may also have multiple issues. So for example, uh, many processes encode a, a floating point add and multiplication in a, in a single instruction. So the peak floating point rate is just the clock rate multiplied by the number of floating operations we can do per clock cycle. Now alongside that, there are a whole series of hardware innovations to try and make that go fast and to try and get squeeze maximum performance out of the processor. And I'll talk about some of these, including pipelining, outer order execution, speculative computation, and so forth. So let's just think about history for a while. 
So I'm sure you've all heard about Moore's law, which roughly speaking says that CPU power doubles every 18 months. And strictly speaking, that really just applies to transistor density. But in many ways, that also translates into, into processor performance. And remarkably, that's held true for about the last 40 years. Of course, it's maybe now self-fulfilling in the sense that if a processor manufacturer cannot keep up with Moore's law, then it tends to go out of business. Uh, and that's happened quite a lot in the sense that there are now very few companies actually manufacturing processors. People have predicted the demise of Moore's law many times, but it may actually finally be happening. Uh, and this is because of the power requirements for processors. It simply isn't possible to turn up the clock frequency any further, essentially, without melting your silicon. So most of the recent increases in processor power are due to increases in parallelism as well as increases in clock rate. In fact, you know, clock rates aren't increasing anymore. So there are several different layers of parallelism going on in a processor. There's some very fine-grained parallelism, which is essentially pipelining. And I'll talk about all these in some more detail as we go along. There's some medium-grained parallelism, which has to do with superscalar execution, SIMD, hardware multi-threading, which essentially is to do with issuing multiple instructions in the same clock cycle. And then there's also some coarse grain parallelism, which is essentially the putting multiple processors on a chip. So as far as the technology we've got in is concerned nowadays, the first two of those sources of parallelism, so the fine grain and the medium grain, seem to be pretty much exhausted. It seems to be hard for the manufacturers to squeeze any more performance out of those. And therefore, the main trend nowadays is towards multi-core. So that's essentially the last thing to do to try and get more performance out of your piece of silicon is just to put more cores on it. OK, so let's think a little bit more about what's actually on the processor. So, Processors are composed of various different functional units, which are the basic building blocks. And the number of type of these units does vary a bit from the with processor design, but most processors include the basics. So let's have a look at these in turn. So first of all, we need an instruction unit. So this is responsible for actually fetching uh, decoding and dispatching of instructions. So the instructions that the program is executing are fetched from instruction caches, the processor, and in, in turn that, those, that data actually comes from memory, but they'll be held, they'll essentially be held in instruction caches on the on the on the processor. The instructions are fairly heavily compressed. So there is a bit of work to do in the hardware to, to decode the instruction. And then the instructions get sent to the out to the appropriate unit. The instruction unit may also have a role in scheduling instructions. And we'll talk a bit about that later. And um, so the, the instruction unit may actually decide something about the order in which instructions actually get executed. So next, we need some units to do some arithmetic. So we'll have an integer unit for integer arithmetic. So this will do integer addition, multiplication, and division. Uh, also logical operations like AND, OR, bit shifts, and so on. Um, some older terminology here, which you might, might come across, is uh, integer units are also known as ALUs, which stands for arithmetic and logic unit. And then we have the floating point unit, which handles the floating point arithmetic. So typically addition, multiplication, and division. Uh, maybe square root as well. 
And this is usually the critical resource for high performance computing. So most scientific codes do more floating point arithmetic than integer arithmetic. So this tends to be the critical resource. And indeed, the machines are advertised and sold and marketed by their peak floating point rate uh, rather than by anything else. So that, of course, can be very misleading because, in fact, the critical resource is not the processor at all. It's, uh, it's how fast we can feed the processor with data from memory. Other units on the processor would be the control unit, which is responsible for branches and jumps. So whenever we get a branch, a program which may come from an if statement or may come from the end of a loop, for example, or a jump, which may come from a function or subroutine call, then there's a unit in the processor which dis essentially decides uh, which instruction is going to be needed next. So it's responsible for changing the control flow in the code. Then we need to be able to get data to and from memory. So we will have a load store unit, which is responsible for loading the data from memory and storing it back. And there must be somewhere to hold that data on the processor. And as we mentioned before, that's the register file. It's local storage in the CPU. Uh, and it's accessed by name, not address. Now, what does that mean? It means that, that the, the register file is not part of the memory system. So it's, it's, it's in some sense separate. It's logically separate from the whole of the rest of the memory system. So the processor, as processor's point of view is that it can take an address from memory, load that into a register, do some arithmetic using, the, using those values, and then can store values from registers back into the memory system again. And modern processors also tend to have all sorts of other stuff on them as well. So things like memory management hardware, cache controllers. There's also the interface to networks, the bus. There may also be other features to do for graphics and multimedia and so on. So let's now start looking at some of the different sorts of parallelism which are in play on modern processors. So the lowest one, lowest level of parallelism that's going on is called pipelining. Uh, and this is an absolutely key implementation technique for making processes fast. So what actually happens is that an, an instruction is are broken down into stages so that each stage can be executed in one CPU clock cycle. And all parts of the CPU operate at a fixed frequency, which is the clock rate. So instead of being able to do a floating point operation in one clock cycle, what actually happens is that that floating point operation is broken down into a number of different stages. And each of those stages executes in one clock cycle. So it actually takes several clock cycles to execute the whole floating point instruction. But the key idea here is that once a stage is completed for one instruction, it can be executed for the next instruction on the subsequent clock cycle. So what this means is that it allows one instruction to be completed on every clock cycle, even though the instruction itself may take many cycles to complete. So for example, on Archer, where we have Intel Ivy Bridge processors, those processors actually have a 14-stage pipeline. So the longest an instruction can take to start to finish is 14 clock cycles. But nevertheless, because we're executing different stages for different instructions at the same time, we can always deliver at least one instruction per clock cycle. However, 
there are some special instructions which are not pipelined, cannot be handled like this. And for scientific programs, the interesting ones are floating point square root and floating point divide. So on most processes, those are not pipelineable instructions. And they take quite a large number of cycles. So they may take 20, 30, or 40 clock cycles to execute a floating point square root. And there can only be one of them going on at a time. So if we have uh, lots of square roots to do, then we only get one square root result every, say, 30 clock cycles. So for that reason, it's quite important when you're optimizing code to try and avoid having lots of divides, floating point divides, or floating point square roots in your innermost loops because the hardware is much less efficient at handling those than it is at handling addition and multiplication. So pipelining is great. It's a powerful technique to get performance out of the processor. But there are three major problems that, that the processor has to take care of. So there's, there's things that can go wrong with pipelining, essentially. So there can be structural hazards, which means that two instructions both require the same piece of hardware at the same time, i.e. on the same clock cycle. There can be data hazards, which means that one instruction depends on the result of another instruction, which is further down the pipeline. So the dependent instruction cannot finish until the earlier instruction has, to, has produced its result. And then there also can be control hazards. So this is what happens when we get branches. We can't keep the pipeline full because we don't know, in principle, which instructions we're going to need to, to load next. So any of these problems can result in stopping and restarting the pipeline. And so cycles can be wasted as a result. But there are a bunch of techniques to try and minimize these problems and to try and keep the pipelines full. So two of the most important of these techniques are out of order execution and branch prediction. So out of order execution, uh, essentially, this, is, this may become maybe a bit of a surprise, but processes don't actually necessarily execute your code in the order in which, ex in which order in which instructions appear in the assembly code. So your assembly code, which is produced from your source code by the compiler, specifies an order of instructions for the program to execute. But in fact, the hardware can choose to reorder those instructions as they're fetched to try and avoid particularly structural and data hazards. Now, as you can imagine, this requires some complicated bookkeeping to ensure correctness. So any reordering that the hardware does must preserve the meaning of the program correctly. So it must be invisible to you as a programmer that this reordering is actually happening. So that's one thing that's, that's going on to try, and try and, minim to try and keep the pipelines full is reordering on, 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 in the hardware on the fly of instructions to try and get the best execution order. The other thing that's done is branch prediction. So essentially what the hardware is trying to do here is trying to guess which way the next branch will go. So whenever you have a, a branch, for example, in an if statement or at the end of the loop, the hardware uses a table that tracks the outcomes of recent branches in the code and uses that history to try and predict which way the next branch in the program is going to go. Uh, and in this case, we can, if it guesses correctly, it keeps the pipeline going. It fetches the, in, the next set of instructions from the right branch uh, and keeps the pipeline full. And only if the prediction is wrong will the pipeline have to stall and wait and get 
the result of the branch before it can ex execute the next instructions. So that's pipelining. And you can think of a pipelining as a, as, a, as a form of instruction level parallelism in the sense that there are multiple instructions in flight at the same time. But pipelining gives us a maximum performance of one instruction per cycle. Now, it's also possible to exploit instruction level parallelism at a higher level. So what we can do in the process is try to in identify instructions that can be executed independently. So in order to be able to do this, they have to use different functional units. And there's two approaches to this, and many modern processes use both of them at the same time. So these are superscalar processes and SIMD, or vector instructions. So the idea of superscalar processes is that the parallel instructions are identified at runtime in the hardware. For vector or SIMD instructions, that's essentially done by the compiler, and the operations on multiple data items are encoded in a single instruction. So let's look a little bit more detail at these, these two processes. So what superscalar processes do is divide up the instructions into classes which use different resources. So you know, one of the most obvious division here would be, for example, between integer instructions and floating point instructions. So then if, if we've got two or more instructions that are in different classes and there's no dependency between them, they can be issued on the same clock cycle and proceed in parallel. So for example, we might be able to issue an integer add and a floating point multiply in the same clock cycle and have them proceed completely in parallel. Now this process can be combined with out of order execution because essentially it's doing the same kind of thing. It's looking at the, looking at the instructions as they come into the processor and deciding to execute them in different order and also to do with whether they can be executed in parallel on the same clock cycle. So the detection of independence is done in hardware. So what actually happens is that instead of fetching one instruction at a time, the hardware will, will fetch multiple instructions at a time look at them all and decide whether they can be issued in one clock cycle or need to be spread across more than one cycle and take, date, take the structural and data hazards into account to try and optimize the schedule of instructions. So most of the responsibility here is with the hardware. So the compiler is not completely without a role. The scheduling can be helped by compiler techniques, which can help to group instructions together in ways which will help the hardware to issue instructions in parallel. So although most of the work here is being done at runtime, on the fly, in the hardware, it's still possible for the compiler and potentially the programmer as well to try and help out by grouping together instructions in, in ways which, which can be executed in parallel. So the other form of instruction level parallelism that will come across in modern processes are SIMD instructions. So SIMD stands for Single Instruction Multiple Data. And these are instructions which encode operations on multiple data items. So for example, a, a simple floating point instruction might encode for, for one addition. So essentially calculating C equals A plus B. But an SIMD floating point instruction could encode both 
g equals a plus b and f equals d plus e into one single instruction. So most modern processors include support for such instructions. So these are called uh, SSE and AVX. It's the more modern version in x86 processors. Also Altivec in power processors. So in order to be able to support this, we require a typically quite substantial extension to the instruction set. So there has to be an, an, a big list of extra instructions that the processor is able to execute to be able to support this. So we need vector versions of loads and stores and vector versions of compares, for example, as well as vector versions of integer and floating point arithmetic instructions. So we need some extra hardware to be able to exploit this. So we need multiple arithmetic units. Uh, and typically also some extra storage, some extra, extra registers on the processor to take advantage of them. So for a given processor, the SIMD width is the number of operations encoded in a SIMD instruction. So typically this will be a small number, so two, four, uh, maybe as much as eight is about as large as you will see in, in modern processors. So this all sounds wonderful, but in order to be able to exploit these instructions, we have to meet a bunch of restrictions. So there are only certain things which SIMD operations can do, in particular the memory operations are often quite constrained. So we will have, for example, uh, SIMD instructions maybe to load two words to two data items from memory at the same time. However, that instruction may require things like the values are actually consecutive in memory, so they actually lie in neighboring addresses, so they may have to be neighboring elements in an array, for example and also that they're aligned on the right boundary. So if we've got an instruction which loads two 8-byte double precision values, then they may have to be correctly aligned on 16-byte boundaries for that to work OK. Now it's the compiler that's going to generate the instructions. So the compiler is responsible for identifying the operations which can be, com can be combined together into SIMD instructions. And the problem is that this often doesn't work too well. Uh, so there are many cases where the compiler doesn't know what the alignment of the data is going to be. And that can cause it to fail to, to generate vector instructions. The compiler can get around this to some extent by generating multiple versions of the code and picking the right one depending on the alignment that actually gets encountered at runtime. Um, but that rapidly explodes into, uh, into many, many versions of the code if, uh, if, if things don't work out well. So sometimes compilers do a reasonable job of generating vector instructions. Sometimes they don't, and people do, you know, particularly people writing numerical libraries and so forth, will often resort to hand coding vector instructions in, in, in some form of assembly code. Okay, so now we've looked at two sources of parallelism, looked at pipelining, looked at instruction level parallelism. So now let's move up one level again and look at multi-core parallelism. So it's now commonplace to have multiple processes on a chip. In fact, you can't really buy anything that, does, that isn't multi-core these days. You know, anything that you, uh, you buy, even, even, in a, even in a basic laptop or, or even down to the level of, uh, of mobile phones, have, have multiple multi-core chips now. 
So the main difference between having multi-core on a chip and, ha and just having one core per chip is that processors may share caches. Um, but we'll come and talk about, we'll talk caches a, uh, a lot later on. It's also possible in some designs that the, the multiple cores may share other resources. In particular, there have been some processor designs in the past where processors are designed so that multiple cores share floating point units, which can cause some complications for optimization. Um, I'm not going to talk any more about that because hopefully people don't design things like that anymore, but it has happened. Um, so in particular, sort of an AMD designs a few years ago had this feature and which complicated matters for, for code optimization and performance quite a lot. So typically what a modern processor looks like is something like this. So on a single chip we will have multiple cores. So those are the CPUs at the top here. Each core will have its own level 1 and level 2 cache memory. Then multiple cores will share a level 3 cache. And then there's a connection from there to, to main memory. But as I said, we'll, we'll talk uh, later on or, um, and also next week about uh, cache memory and, and how that works. So what does this kind of design mean? Well, it means that multiple cores on the same chip can communicate with each other very quickly. Um, so transferring data between cores that are on the same chip has very low latency and very high bandwidth. Because essentially all that's happening is that data is being read and written uh, and cached in the shared cache. So in that case, it's the level three cache and it's on the chip, so that's really fast. However, on the downside, the cores contend for space in the shared cache. Um, so it's harder to have precise control over what data is in the cache. And if only a single core is running, then it may have access to the whole shared cache. So if you do speed up tests on a single chip, you can see some strange effects. Uh, and also, cores have to share off-chip bandwidth for access to main memory. And again, if you just have a single core running, it may have access to more than its fair share of the memory bandwidth. So this is something to be aware of. If you do scaling tests within a single processor, you will often see less than ideal scaling. Uh, even though everything's perfectly parallel, uh, or there's no, there's no load balance problem, there's no communication going on between different cores, nevertheless, you don't get ideal speed up because of this sharing of hardware resources. So multiple cores in particular have to share memory bandwidth. So yet another possibility for squeezing performance out of processors is to do with having multiple hardware threads per core. Now, how is this possible? What, what, pos what, what use can we, can we put this to? Well, as I said, most modern processors are, are superscalar, so they can issue several instructions in every clock cycle and the selection and scheduling of instructions is done on the fly in the hardware. So a typical processor is able to issue maybe four or five instructions per clock cycle. That's the normal sort of number, uh, with those instructions going to different functional units. So obviously, the, the, in order for that to work, there can't be any dependencies between those the instructions issued on the same clock cycle. 
Now that would all be fantastic, but actually, app typical applications don't have that much parallelism in them. So the amount of parallelism you actually find in programs isn't four or five times, it's only maybe one and a half or two. So if you look at a typical program, you, on average, you can only find maybe up to two instructions per clock cycle that it can actually go in parallel. So what that means is that when you're running in a real programs, often more than half the available instruction slots are actually empty because there's nothing that the hardware can find to schedule in there because of the dependencies between instructions. So one possible solution to this is what's called simultaneous multi-threading, or SMT. It's, you may also hear it called hyper-threading, which is actually Intel's proprietary name for it. Um, but that's, that's, that's often used instead. So what that's trying to do is to try and fill up those spare instruction lot in slots by mixing instructions from more than one thread on the same clock cycle. In order to be able to do that, there has to be some replication of the hardware. Um, so there has to be a certain amount of hardware replicated per thread, but actually it's not very much. So, for example, so Intel Xeons, for example, uh, which support two SMT threads per core, the extra silicon you need to be able to do that is only about an extra 5%. So it's a relatively low overhead in the hardware because almost everything else can be shared between the threads. So include, so the functional units, the register files, memory system, uh, everything else is, is shared between, between the threads. For most architectures, maybe two or four threads is, is all that makes sense. Uh, though modern, some modern designs are trying to push that a bit further. So for example, uh, IBM, the Power 8 processor supports eight SMT threads per core. So here's a little diagram which is intended to try and show what, what's going on here. So in, in this diagram, imagine that uh, what would happen if we executed two threads on two different CPUs on two different cores. So we've got a red thread and a blue thread here. Um, so in each of these little diagrams, time goes down the way and across the way are the different instruction slots. So we've got a potential of, in, of executing five instructions on every clock cycle. But you can see, for example, in the red thread on the first clock cycle, only the first and third instruction slots are full. And on the blue thread, only the second instruction slot is full. So because of, and the, these gaps occur, so all the white space here is instruction slots which are empty. And that will be because there are dependencies between the instructions. It's because instructions are, require the values which are produced by earlier instructions. So you can see in this example, the piece of code the red thread is executing and the piece of code the blue thread is executing, both of those take six clock cycles going down the way to execute. Now what SMT tries to do is to try and merge those two threads together and therefore fill up the instruction slots. Now, there may not always be uh, room to do that. So for example, if you look on the second clock cycle and at the fourth instruction slot, here, there's, there's something from the red thread and something from the blue thread. So those can't both happen at the same time. 
So one of them has to be delayed until later. But nevertheless, if we merge these two threads together and try and execute them on one core, we can fill up a lot of those empty instruction slots. So instead of taking each thread, taking six clock cycles to execute those groups of instructions, we manage to execute them together in, one, in seven clock cycles, but just using one core. So is this any good? How successful is this? Well, in practice, it's very much dependent on the application and to what extent the, the threads contend for the shared resources. So in practice, the gains seem to be limited to around maybe 20 or 30 percent for two cores over a single thread, for example. Um, so you certainly, you certainly are not going to see for almost any code, you're not going to see a two times speed up by using two hardware threads per core. And in particular, the benefits will be limited if both threads is, are using the same functional units. So for example, if the threads are intensively using the floating point units, then the, the benefits will be limited because there are, you know, there, you've just got two threads trying to share the same resources. And in fact, for particularly for memory intensive code, SMT can actually cause slowdown. There may be increased contention for memory bandwidth. There can be increased contention for space in the caches. And also, you've got to get that extra parallelism from somewhere. You've got to find extra threads from your program. So increasing the number of threads and processes can increase overheads such as communication or load imbalance. And that can typically outweigh the benefits of, of using the multiple hardware threads. So it's very much one of these um, try it and see kind of things. You know, it might help your application. It might not. Um, you, you, all, all you can really do is try it. It's very hard to predict a priori what's going to happen. So I'm not going to talk very much about accelerated devices, but just to just to mention them in passing and, and, and put them in a little bit of context here. So current popular trend in, in HPC system design is to include additional special purpose processors alongside the main CPU. So these are characterized by having large numbers of relatively simple cores. So for example, some of the hardware that's used to do things like the out of order execution and to do branch prediction. So some of those things are thrown away in accelerators. So the cores become smaller and you can fit more of them onto, onto a processor. They're typically also designed to have very high memory bandwidth. Uh, otherwise, having all these extra cores would be no use because you wouldn't be able to feed them with data fast enough from memory. And in modern designs, they have separate memory from the CPU. At the moment, in this regime, most of the current interest is focused on GP GPUs, so general purpose graphics processing units. Um, partly this is a case of uh, economics, uh, so these things are relatively cheap um, because GPUs are produced in, in high volumes for the mass market. Um, however, they're quite tricky to program and they suffer from significant overheads in moving data to and from the GPU memory. So although the GPU itself is very fast, if you need to move a lot of data uh, and often between the CPU and the GPU, then that can result in poor performance. So another 
processor design, which is which you could also think of an accelerator, is uh, the Xeon Phi's. So these are more like conventional CPUs than than GPUs, but they have a lot of low power cores. So um, current generation of Xeon Phi's have about 60 cores in them. They also use SMT and wide SIMD units, so wide vector units, uh, to bump up the floating point performance. So hardware will continue to evolve. Um, so this design, having, having very separate accelerators, may not continue in the long term. Um, it's unattractive from a power consumption point of view, having to, particularly having to have two lots of memory um, per, per processor or per node. Um, so in, industry tends certainly suggest that the future, the future will see a tighter integration um, of simple cores on, onto a single piece of silicon. So we may end up with designs that have both complex cores like current x86 designs and simple cores on the same chip and connected to the same memory. Um, so that's probably, we're probably looking at two or three years away before, before we see that kind of thing coming in. Anyway, that was just a little bit of an aside to, uh, to put accelerators into context and, and not going to focus on them anymore in, in, in these talks. That's a whole, uh, so programming for accelerators and optimizing for accelerators is a, is a whole separate topic, um, which uh, I'm not going to go into here. So I now want to move on from processes and, and, and start thinking about the memory. So I've already started to discuss this a little bit. Um, but memory is absolutely key uh, to performance on most HPC systems and for most scientific codes. And the reason for that is that memory speed is almost always the limiting factor for HPC applications. So keeping the CPU fed with data is key to performance. So Although you know, machines are described and sold and marketed by their peak floating point capability, what we will see in practice is that most applications only achieve a very small fraction of the peak floating point capability of the machine. So uh, if you want to put some numbers on it, you know, 5%, 10% is fairly typical. So achieving applications that achieve 10% of peak floating point performance, that's normally considered quite a good result. There are applications that can do better than that. Um, they're typically ones which are doing dense linear algebra. So uh, dense matrix computations can do better than that. Um, but mostly, most applications don't. Um, and the, the reason for that is that um, although there's plenty of floating point work in there, it's the critical resource is getting the data out of memory rather than calculating the first floating point arithmetic. And memory is actually also a substantial contributor to the cost of systems. Um, so, you know, find that typical HPC systems have a few gigabytes of memory per core. Um, it's technically possible to have a lot more than that, um, but it's just too expensive and too power hungry. When we're thinking about memory, there's essentially two key metrics we're interested in. There's the latency. So that's how long you have to wait, wait for data to arrive. So when a processor issues, say, a load instruction, how many clock cycles does it have to wait for that data to get returned from memory? The other metric is bandwidth. So if we are, continue to ask for data and keep asking and keep asking, what's the maximum rate at which we can feed data into the processor? For modern processors, typically these, these numbers come out at 
hundreds of nanoseconds or around 100 nanosecond mark for, for latency and looking at a few gigabytes per second per core. So you'll see immediately, you know, if you think that a processor, how you know, a processor is say at two or two to three gigahertz, it can do you know, four or eight floating point operations per second, then you know a hundred nanoseconds is a long time. That's you know two two to three hundred clock cycles. So you can do an awful lot of floating point arithmetic in the time that it takes to get one piece of data out of memory. So if all we had were processors and main memory, we would be absolutely completely in trouble for that reason. Um, so memory latencies are very long. Uh, typically hundreds of processor clock cycles. So as I said, fetching data from main memory is essentially two orders of magnitude slower than doing arithmetic. So we've got to do something to try and to try and, and overcome that problem. And the solution is to, to have cache memory. So this is memory which is much faster than main memory but also much smaller than main memory. And it's used to keep copies of recently used data in the hope that the program is going to access that data again. So subsequent accesses are fast, are much faster than getting it from, from main memory. So we've already seen modern systems typically use a hierarchy two or typically, more typically nowadays, three levels of, of cache. And they're typically all on, on, the, on the silicon, on the, on the chip. So we end up with something that looks like this in terms of a memory hierarchy. So at the top here, we have the CPU registers. Then going downwards, we have the various levels of cache, level one cache, level two cache, level three cache. And at the bottom, we have main memory. So as we go down the hierarchy, the speed at which, or the latency at which we can get data uh, goes up. Okay, so for to get data from, from CPU registers, we can do that in one clock cycle. To get it from level one cache is maybe two or three cycles. Level two, we're up to about 20 cycles. Level three, maybe 50. And main memory, maybe a couple of hundred. But also, as we go down the hierarchy, the capacity increases. So the amount of data that the CPU can store in its registers is order of one kilobyte. Level one cache, maybe order of 100 kilobytes. Level two, a few megabytes. Level three, a few tens of megabytes. Uh, and main memory, or to say order of gigabytes. So as we go down the hierarchy, the amount of data that can be stored is much bigger but the cost of, of accessing it also goes up. Okay, well, that's us just about out of time for today. So I think that would be a good point uh, for, me, for me to stop for this week. And, and so next week, I'll talk more about how caches work. Uh, and I'll also talk about the uh, cache coherency problem. So that's uh, what what has to be done to make caches work where you've got multiple cores on a chip. Uh, and I'll also talk about virtual memory. And I'll also talk, uh, to make some of these ideas concrete, I'll also discuss the actual processor, the design uh, that's used on Archer. So I'll stop talking now. But if anybody would like to ask any questions, uh, I'm happy to take them.
Okay, so question about about speculative computation is is that related is that related to to branch prediction? Uh, essentially, yes. So what will happen with uh, is that um, the branch is is guessed, and then the processor will will execute the instructions it thinks it's going to need. Um, but it has to then be able to back out of that if that was if that was the wrong branch. Um, so yes, absolutely, that's that's really part of the same process. Is is trying to keep the pipeline full um, even in the presence of branches. Okay, well, thank you very much for. Oh, one more question. So SimDewitz is the vector unit. Yes, that's right. Okay, so SimDewitz is the essentially the number of, of, of uh, data items that can be processed in the same time uh, in the vector units. Yeah, that's correct. So how can you get how can you get that information? So um, I guess how do, how do you know what it is for a particular processor? Um, it's you really just have to go and find the documentation for the for the processor. It's um, it, and, but you can also say what is you know look at what in instruction set the processor supports. So it's hard coded into the instruction set. So for example, for uh, on Archer we've got uh, x86 Ivy Bridge. So that supports AVX instruction sets. So that's um, essentially a four-way floating point if we're in double precision. Okay, great. So if there aren't any more questions, uh, thank you very much for listening and uh, hope you can make it for part two next week.